Hello, this is Julie Hoag with the Vegetarians and Meat Lovers Split Table Recipes podcast. On my podcast, we talk about cooking. We talk about a lot of recipes for split table recipes, split table families, where there are more than one type of diet in the household, like vegetarians and meat lovers. Today, I have an amazing awesome chef who has made the cookbook Easy Plant-Based Cooking for Two, delicious vegan recipes to enjoy together. And it's a beautiful book. It has 80 simple and wholesome dishes. The pictures are gorgeous. It is such a useful book and it can be used in so many ways. And you can find her on Instagram at under her name, Lay, let me spell it for you, L E I. S-H-I-S-H-A-K. And I will put all of her links down in the podcast notes so that you can easily access her on Instagram, her books on Amazon, and her website as well. So I'm really excited to introduce her and she has a lot of amazing things to say. She has an amazing career in cooking different things. She's an amazing chef. She has so many good things to say. We had such a great chat. I had so much fun chatting with her, and I am ready to share it. Are you ready? All right, let's go. Let's do it. Woohoo! Okay, everyone, I'm so excited. I'm so pumped to talk to this person. I have been waiting to talk to her and it's just, she has this amazing book. Well, she has several amazing cookbooks out there, but the one she has out right now is Easy Plant-Based Cooking for Two, Delicious Vegan Recipes to Enjoy Together. And her name is Lei Shishek. Welcome, Lei. Thank you. Hi, Julie. It's so nice to meet you. I'm really excited to talk with you. I'm very excited to be here as well. So I guess my first question for you is, are you a vegan? I do not consider myself a vegan. I do eat meat and animal products occasionally. I would probably fall into the category of a flexitarian. Okay. Yeah. Which means you eat, is that you eat fish, right? Is that what flexitarian is? You eat fish. So pescatarian. Yeah. Let's go over this. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I know it can get confusing. So yeah, there's different levels of plant-based eating and one can be a vegetarian, which is someone who consumes vegetables, but also does and may consume animal products like eggs or dairy. And then you've got pescatarian and that's a vegetarian who eats seafood. Then you've got a flexitarian, and that's someone who consumes mostly plant foods, but occasionally does eat small amounts of animal products. And so that's that's the category that that I would fall in. And then, as you mentioned, there are vegans and raw vegans, and then there's also whole food plant-based eaters. And then I guess we should cover too, what exactly is plant-based eating? Someone doesn't really know what that means. What does it mean? Yeah, so it's it's a pretty general term for a lifestyle where you're focused on eating foods that come directly from nature. So we're talking about grains, beans, nuts, fruits, vegetables, and legumes and seeds too, actually. So really matters though, is that you're eating these and the majority of your diet comes from these sources. So that's what plant-based eating is. I gotcha. And so like, I'm a vegetarian, but I still consume dairy products. I don't do any meat. I don't do any fish, but I will do like eggs and cheese and milk. So then I'm just called a vegetarian, correct? You're a vegetarian. (laughs) That's that's how I always thought it was too. So (laughs) I'm right. (laughs) I've been living this way for a long time. How long have you been eating this particular diet? Has it been a lifelong thing or is it kind of new? So it's pretty new to me. I have always been a meat eater. I grew up in a meat eating household. I mean, we had meat breakfast, lunch, dinner. We snacked on meat. It was just, you know, my parents would smoke and dry meat in our fireplace. We raised Mm. chickens. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah. I was surrounded by meat. So, you know, but as I got older and wanted to start taking care of my body and obviously being in the restaurant world and being a chef, you know, you're surrounded by, you know, lots of amazing produce. And so, you know, my, my diet maybe wasn't, you know, as, as heavy on the animal products, but I still, 
I still ate meat, but the real turning point for me was the start of the pandemic. Actually, I had just sold my bakery, which I had run for 10 years and Mm -hmm. sold it in March of 2022, right at the start of the pandemic. And I really, I was at home like everyone else, (laughs) wondering (laughs) what to do with my time. And uh, I just decided uh, it was time for me to really start eating healthier and taking care of my body. And, you know, we're all getting older and, you know, joints start to hurt and you start (laughs) feeling your back more and your knees start hurting. And I just wanted to to treat my body better than I, than I had been. Uh, Many chefs, you know, we get off work late, we're starving, we get off at midnight Mm -hmm. and like the only thing open is like fast food or bars (laughs) and and all they have are like fried foods and and they're typically fried meat products. Right. So that's what I've been putting into my body for many, many years. And, uh, I started searching online. I started hearing about plant-based this and plant-based that. And I was like, what is this plant-based thing? So I just did some research and uh, I I liked how it seemed a little bit more flexible and it seemed more approachable for me as Mm. opposed to just becoming just all of a sudden, I'm going to go vegan. Like I just, I knew I couldn't do that. And that, you know, that wasn't going to happen in my household because I, you know, my, I live in a household of two with my husband and he's a meat eater and Mm. There's just no way that I could bring, you know, be like, <laughs> we're going vegan. <laughs> Surprise. <Right. laughs> so plant-based eating seemed to be perfect for me. And I wanted to learn more. So I enrolled for my plant-based nutrition certificate with the T. Colin Campbell School of Nutrition. And nice. um, it's an on yeah, it's an online course. I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in in learning more about plant-based eating. It's an online fully remote course and you learn a ton. And, you know, I wasn't so sure because I'd never taken online programs. And I have to tell you, I learned so much and it was taught by really knowledgeable instructors. So anyhow, long story short, that's how I fell into plant-based eating. And, um, and then I started talking to my agent and my editor and about ideas for my next cookbook. And, and I told them about how I was you know, starting to follow a plant-based diet. And I really thought there was a trend towards, towards plant-based eating. And, and that's what this book is, came to be from all of those discussions. Right. I think you're right. I think there is a trend towards that. And a lot of it is the health benefits. What are some other health benefits that eating a plant-based diet could give a person? So plants are full of nutrients and minerals and they're anti-inflammatory. They're also very low in saturated fats. So they're going to keep your cholesterol levels down. They have a lot of phyto, phytonutrients in them. They're going to help with your fiber intake. They're very high in fiber. They're also going to help you regulate your blood sugar because they're low in saturated fats. They're going to help you lower your weight because they're rich in low glycemic foods. So you're not going to get that spike in your blood sugar levels. They also will help you keep feeling full longer. So there's, there's just a ton of benefits from eating, eating plants that our our bodies thrive on. I think it's a really interesting point that you just said high in protein. Like I've been a vegetarian since I was in eighth grade, but constantly all my life, I have been barraged with questions. Well, do you get enough protein? what do you eat? And and so for me being in the Midwest, you know, growing up when I did, it was very unusual for someone to be a vegetarian, you know, in Minnesota, it was, it was odd, you know, like I was, I should have been, I should have been born in California. I'm telling you, (laughs) (laughs) but you know, people would say that to me all the time. Like, are you getting enough food? Are you getting enough protein? I'm like, well, yeah. You know, it's, I think it's so odd that people have that opinion where if you're not eating meats, you're not getting enough protein. That's, that's so true. Yeah. And like, if someone wants to just do, I remember they taught us this in the the certificate class I was taking, like one serving of tofu is just like three and a half ounces. And if you actually weigh out three and a half ounces of tofu and you see how much that is, it's not much actually, Mm -hmm. if you're actually looking at that amount of tofu and I was like, oh my gosh, that's all I need. And they're like, that's all (laughs) you need. (laughs) Right. Yeah. It's totally doable to get enough protein on a plant-based diet. So are there any drawbacks to being on a plant-based diet? So there's a, there are a few, and I do talk about them in, in the intro to my 
book, one thing you want to keep in mind is that plant-based proteins are incomplete proteins. So they don't contain all nine essential amino acids that our bodies need. So what you want to do is focus eating on complete proteins. So that's, we're talking about the soy, the tofu, the quinoa, and you want to mix it with high protein plant foods. So like chickpeas and kidney beans and flax seeds and pumpkin seeds and things like that. So so you want a good mix of anything. I always keep in my mind quinoa and soy. Like when I'm eating during mm. the week, I'm like, okay, got to make sure I'm eating quinoa and soy at least for you know a good number of the meals that I have during the week. And if you focus on that, then you'll be okay. The other thing is if you're strictly vegan, so you're not eating any animal products at all, you're, you might run into the problem of lacking vitamin B12. So mm, what you yep, might want to yep. do is just take a supplement or occasionally if you can have some nutritional yeast or fortified foods, then you'll be okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. I kind of forgot the nutritional yeast was one way you could get that. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So what are your top, I mean, you just mentioned a few of your top favorites. Are there any other favorite top plant-based foods that you really like to cook with that you like your go-to or just something you really enjoy? I, I think I mentioned chickpeas, which I do mm. enjoy a lot. I feel like they're so easy to add to yeah, yeah. like salads. You just want to toss in some chickpeas. It's easy enough. Sometimes I'll make a vegetable curry and I'll just toss in some chickpeas or some kidney beans because it's so easy just at the end. And, and, and obviously chickpeas, you can buy canned and kidney beans you can buy canned. It's just, they're so easy to have in your pantry and you just need to warm them because they're already cooked, obviously. And then I'd probably say maybe lentils. I really enjoy as well. I like to make uh, veggie burgers with lentils and mm -hmm. they're just, again, you can, you can, you know, boil lentils on your own. But recently I've just discovered canned lentils and they're just delicious and, and so much easier to use than boiling them on your own. So yeah, canned versus you, cause you can buy them hard too, right? They're like a hard. Yes. You can buy them dried and yeah, yeah. Um, which, you know, is certainly doable. It just saves a step. You know, you don't have to pick through them. Sometimes there's pebbles in them and things like that and rinse them. And then you got to ah. cook them and they can take a while to cook. So it's just, it's saving time in the kitchen. I like to save time in the kitchen whenever possible. So oh, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, you know, people who purchase easy plant-based cooking for two, we'll see that like, you know, that these are easy, approachable recipes. And I think it's perfect for anyone who's curious about the plant-based diet and just incorporating more plants into their diet. These recipes are super, super do doable. I love that. And I love how it's cooking for two. I mean, it really, it can be cooking for one, right? You will just have leftovers. Yes, absolutely. You yeah. can definitely be cooking for one. I mean, and also it can be cooking for four. These recipes are easily doubled. So, right. you know, I tried to, I tried to make um, the recipes as easy as possible where it's, you know, like half a cup of this, two cups of this. So if you got to double it, it's, it's easy to double. Right. I try to stay away from like the third. That kind of gets painful. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Three eighths of a carrot, right. you know? <laughs> yeah. Right. We want easy. We don't want to do a math problem. We want to Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so what are some other top favorite foods that you like to stock your pantry with when you are thinking about doing a plant-based meal? Yeah. So aside, I'd, I'd probably say if you opened up my pantry right now, you'd see a lot of canned beans for sure. Mm -hmm. I do have a lot of canned tomatoes. I love those products. And then I have I try and buy nuts and seeds in bulk. So my fridge actually has a lot of like plastic containers of nuts and seeds. So again, like nuts and seeds are so easy to throw on to salads. I throw them onto my oatmeal in the morning. Mm, so yeah. yeah, I try to stick with those. I also would say I stock up my freezer with frozen vegetables too. So, mm -hmm. you know, obviously I like to buy fresh, but sometimes, you know, if there's a sale on frozen vegetables, I'm there, you know, I'm all about just, uh, you know, cost cutting and limiting the amount of trips I have to take to the grocery store. Right. And you know, frozen, you can do a lot with frozen vegetables. Yeah. I mean, I like fresh too, but it's frozen is a nice option. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly, you know, frozen peas, frozen corn, frozen okra. I, I eat those a lot. Right. So in your book, Easy Plant-Based Cooking for Two, would this be a good book for someone to get, you think, if they were just starting the journey of 
doing plant ba- plant I don't know I can't talk plant based dieting eating it's not really called dieting it's eating yeah I know we all we switch back and <laughs> forth <laughs> it's, well, it's, yeah. more, it's more of a lifestyle but totally get where you're coming from and and yes <laughs> I do I do think this would be perfect for the beginner who's curious about learning more about how to incorporate plants to their diet and and I really tried to not, you know, I'm not going to put down vegan cooking by any means, but, you know, I think a lot of people are hesitant or they kind of shy away from when they see like, Ooh, vegan recipes, like there's going to be some strange ingredients and things like that. that. Yeah. 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 And I, and I get it, you know, you might be like, you know, flaxseed, what's bad, you know? (laughs) And and I tried, you know, there, there are, there's flaxseed in my, in my book, there's chia seed, you know, there's certain, there's oh, nutritional yeah. yeast, but I didn't overload it with, with those ingredients. I really tried to stick with basic pantry staples that someone who is not necessarily a plant-based eater would have in their pantry. And I think, mm-hmm. I think I was able to do that because I, like I said, came from a big meat eating household. I still considered myself, you know, an occasional meat eater. So, you know, this is how I just liked to cook and incorporate more vegetables in, in, into my diet. And so I hope it's very approachable for everyone. That's awesome. Do you have any other tips that you haven't mentioned yet for someone who wants to try this type of eating? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I always tell people first is figure out why you want to do it, you know, and that's really what's going to drive you to stick with it. Determine your motivation is what I say in my book. And then from there, I always suggest meatless Mondays first. It's the easiest thing to do. And it's kind of fun because it's just one day a week and you get to look forward to it. You have the whole week to plan what you're going to eat on meatless Mondays. (laughs) And it's very doable. So I would say that. Another thing that helped me I remember I learned this in my plant-based class was start viewing meat as a side dish Mm. as opposed to the main entree. So if you've got a, you're filling up your plate with food, you know, have just a small amount of meat on the side, like a, you know, a quarter of the plate should just be animal product and the rest should all be plants. And that was really helpful for me too, because that way you're not totally eliminating meat from your plate. It's just a small, much smaller portion. So I would say that meal prep as much as possible. So I found that it was easy if I made a big batch of rice or grains earlier in the week, and then I had it ready to go. That was ready to go in the fridge. And all I had to do on the other days was maybe cook a quick vegetable stir fry. And then I already had a grain to go along with it. Um, I would say stick to familiar flavors, things that you like to eat, you know, don't go all you know, if, if you've never liked celery, don't start cooking celery dishes. <laughs> like, right. You know, let's make this enjoyable for you. And then, you know, if if your budget allows, I always felt that if you could, there's a lot of great like plant-based meal delivery services out there. If you can afford it and, and you just want to like order, you know, maybe three meals a week that are plant-based it's a, it's a convenient way to kind of start introducing more plants into your diet without having the stress of like, oh, what do I cook? It's already decided for you and it's, you know, at your doorstep. Those are great tips. And I have a question for you that just popped in my head when you're talking about that. So like every time I make rice and I put it in the fridge, I feel like it dries out. Do you have any tricks Mm. like to do that, to make it not dry out? Like the days after when it's left over, I just feel like it gets so dry. Yeah. So, well, what I do, I don't know what anyone else does, but <laughs> I, I warm it. I put it in a microwave safe container and then I cover it with a damp paper towel mm. and then I warm it that way. And so that way it's steaming and it's adding more moisture back into the rice. Oh, I like that trick. I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it, it, it works for me. <laughs> yeah, because like when we've done that or we have leftover stir fry or something, then it's kind of like, you know, it's dried out. I'm kind of almost like I should just make another batch of rice, but I don't really want to waste the rice that I already mm-hmm. have cooked, you know, so that's yep, a great yep. tip. Another thing you could do, which is what we do a lot too, is my, my husband lo- loves um, fried rice. So if mm-hmm. you're, you know, if you've got leftover rice, in the fridge and it has dried out, then actually that's exactly what you want for fried rice is a drier rice. that's going to soak in all the flavors of a, a fried rice. So okay. um, I'll use it for that too. Do you cook it in an oil then? 
I do. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Very, very interesting. I never yeah. thought of doing that. That's a great idea. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> Oil. And then, yeah, you flavor it with a little soy sauce. And sometimes I add some mirin, which is like a sweet cooking wine. And that, oh, that, okay. that adds really nice flavor too. Very nice. So I would love to know a little bit more about your training and experience. Sure. So as far as my professional training, let's see, I went to the Culinary Institute of America in upstate New York, and that's where I studied my chef training. And that was a two-year program. And after that, I moved out to Los Angeles, and I just worked my way through a few restaurants in the LA area and I was focused on pastry actually. That was, that was my oh. background. Yeah. So I worked in a number of different pastry kitchens in LA. And then I had the amazing opportunity to work with chef Michael Mina at his restaurant. It was called Stonehill Tavern and it was down in Dana Point, California. So I moved south of LA down to Orange County and I was the executive pastry chef there for oh, um, awesome. Yeah, maybe four or five years I was there. And then I had always wanted to open up my own bakery and I had found the perfect location in the wonderful beach town called San Clemente. Mm. And so I left the restaurant world to do that. And I did that for 10 years and it was an amazing experience to run one's own business. And yeah. Lots of fun, lots of fun for sure. And then my my 10 year lease was up in March 2022, which was, you know, so fortunate for me. I mean, I was ready to go anyway. And as I said, like my joints were hurting, my knees were hurting, mm, like, right. my body was basically screaming at me. So it was it was perfect timing for me. Yeah, that's that's kind of that's my background in restaurants and as far as um, cookbooks. The way my first cookbook came to be was because I had opened my bakery and a lot of my customers just loved the recipes and they wanted the recipes. And, and I was like, gosh, I should write a cookbook with yeah. all of the bakery's recipes in it. And that's, that was my first cookbook called Beach House Baking. Nice. And that's what got me on the path to writing more cookbooks. So I think that's awesome. And it's a really fun title. You know what I mean? Like when I think about beach house, like that's awesome. And then baking, awesome. Like that's just a fun combo. You know, you think about, oh yeah, <laughs> yes. I know. There's not one bad word in that title. I know, right? <laughs> like that's beach, yes, house, yes. <laughs> and then you did the, did you do the farm to table desserts cookbook after the beach house baking? Um, I did beach house baking and then I did beach house brunch shortly thereafter. Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then and then I then I did farm to table desserts and then I went back to beach house dinners. <laughs> nice. And then I guess it's easy plant based cooking for two is the next one. Wow, that's awesome. That's a great yeah. collection. I love the beach house idea because it's just fun. I mean, Thank I live you. in Minnesota and it's, I know. <laughs> to me, I'm like, ooh, you know. <laughs> beach house. Yeah, yeah. Well, we thought, you know, between my agent and my wonderful editor and at Skyhorse Publishing, you know, we just kind of thought about, you know, what would really make this appeal to people? And I hear I've got this bake shop literally, you know, half a mile from the ocean. And I'm fortunate enough to live in this beautiful, you know, beach town city and, and, you know, let's, let's turn this into a cookbook that could transport people to beaches, you know, wherever. Absolutely. Cause you know, my family, a lot of times we'll go to the beach, we'll rent a beach house for, you know, our vacation. So what a great fun way to think about that and like be yeah. like, oh, we can yeah, <laughs> have that all year, we have that taste all year round. Just exactly. Funness. That's fun. <laughs> One of your reviewers said, we talked about this a few, you know, a little bit ago, but one of your reviewers said you break down the barrier between plant-based food and everyday food. I really love that. And do you think this person was referring to how doable your recipes are, or do you think they meant something else? I do. Yeah. Oh gosh. Hannah Kaminsky. Okay. So she's an amazing <laughs> vegan cookbook author. And yes, I was so thrilled when I read her comment because I, oh, she gets it. I think she gets it, you know? And yeah. And yet I do think that what she meant was that there is this kind of fear or like barrier that other people who are not familiar with vegan diets view vegan diets. Like they're yes. not approachable and like, oh, 
I don't even want to go down that path kind of thing. Right. Like weird stuff. Yeah. 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 So I think, you know, when she's read my cookbook, she saw how, how doable and approachable they are. I know I feel like I keep saying approachable, but I feel like that's the (laughs) best word to to describe these, these recipes in the cookbook. So I believe that's what Hannah meant when she said that. Yeah. That's, that's how I took it too. I'm like, it's just doable. It's something you can do every day. It's not this big production. Like, you know, and I like to cook gourmet too, but sometimes it gets too much time, too much involved and you need, you're hungry. You want to eat, you know? Yeah. (laughs) We're busy. We're busy. We want something easy and good. Exactly. Sometimes there's there's a time and a place for everything. There's a time to do something really long and involved, but that's not going to be your every day. Right. Exactly. So you did talk about your husband and you both eating meat. Do you find it difficult flip-flopping between meat meals and non-meat? I don't think it's that challenging. Um, because even when I have, you know, may, maybe I'll eat a salad and I'll toss chickpeas in mine to to boost up the protein, I may add, you know, a piece of salmon to his. So sure, sure. it's, you know, it's all about utilizing what you're already making. So you're not, you know, making two different meals. Yep. So uh, yeah, I'm sure you know this well. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. So if I'm, you know, cooking if I've got rice, you know, his dish is going to have rice, obviously. If I've got a roasted, you know, with roasted broccoli, his dish is also going to have roasted broccoli. And then, you know, maybe I've got, you know, seared tofu on mine, but he's got, you know, a seared chicken breast on his, that kind of thing. So right. it's, it's, yeah, it's just utilizing, you know, many of the same components, but having, you know, two different meals, but they're, they're similar in nature. Yeah, that's what I do a lot too. And it reduces you being a short order cook where you have to completely Correct. make a different meal for the person not eating meat. <laughs> right, right. Which is what I try to avoid because I'm yeah. busy and I don't want to do that. <laughs> so I have to ask you, how many times do you make a recipe before you decide it's cookbook ready? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> Gosh, it depends, Julie. I mean, there's some... I mean, I hesitant, hesitate to say this, but, you know, the apple oat cakes recipe in the cookbook, I probably made that 20 times. Like, it, oh, was, like, sure, it sure. was the bane of my existence, but I was, I was <laughs> determined to get it, to get it right. I wanted it right texture, the right flavor. And yeah, some come easy. Some, you know, if I'm fortunate enough, it takes one time, you know, and some take, yeah. it takes so many, so much more. So it, it just depends. I would say maybe on average three to five times just to be sure, you know, even if I like it the first time, I'm going to make it again, obviously, because I got to make sure I write, I wrote the recipe down correctly and things like that. So (laughs) yeah. So just it fluctuates. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, yeah, you're getting so involved in making something, you may not, you may not take the notes properly. So you need to, yeah, Mm -hmm. you need to make it again to make sure that what you have written down is realistic. Yeah. Yeah. It's very true. And, you know, I usually have my laptop in the kitchen as I'm cooking, but, you know, as sometimes when you're so involved with cooking, you actually forget to step back and then type it in what you're doing and then you got to go back. So yeah, there's, there's, there's huge, many chances for error when it comes to developing a recipe. Oh, absolutely. And where do you find your inspiration when you're going to make a new recipe? Are you like, do you see something else someone else made? Or do you just think, I just want to make something with X, Y, Z? Do you have a a set inspiration or is it multiple different ways that it comes to you? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. With this rest, with this cookbook, I, what I did was I actually took a piece of paper and I wrote down my favorite vegetables or even yeah. vegetables that I have wanted to cook with, but I hadn't, you know, mm. for instance, like jackfruit, I had never worked with before oh, writing this yeah. cookbook. And so that, that was on my list because I just, I wanted to learn what to do with it. <laughs> like I had no right. idea. I've never done it. I know. Yeah. I'll have to look at your book because I've off, I've seen it, but I've never actually tried it. Yeah. Correct. Yep. Yeah, that's where I was. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, there is, there is a jackfruit burrito recipe in my cookbook. That's how I ended up using it. Nice. Yeah, I just wrote down, you know, you know, what do I like? I like cauliflower, broccoli, you know, bok choy, like whatever I liked. And then from there, I came up with different ideas and wrote down, you know, like, okay, roasted cauliflower steak, you know, something like that. And then I just, I mm. just 
everything's written for me. That, that's how I do it. I just write them all out on a piece of paper and then I start figuring out how to develop each one. Right. Very fun. I think it's fun. I like doing recipe development too. I think it's just, it's just fun. I, I like to try new things too. So mm -hmm. it's a fun thing to do. <laughs> yes, it is. And your pictures are gorgeous. So now do you take your own photos for your books or do you have someone come in and take your pictures? Thank you. For this one, I took all the food photos. Nice. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I was really happy with how these photos came out. And yeah, you know, I would say that I do not consider myself a photographer by, by any means, but, you know, along the way, after having taken photographs for, you know, my two previous cookbooks, mm -hmm. I've picked up a lot of, you know, tips and I just found that lighting is like, Probably yes. one of the most important factors. And yep. if you just find spots in your house or apartment, wherever you live, where the lighting hits just right, like this time of day, <laughs> then <laughs> stick with it. You know, I've got one spot in the living room, one spot in the kitchen, one spot in the dining room where, you know, that those are the three places in the house that I always try taking photos at because it just seems to work out really nicely with how the light comes in. Yeah. And time of day really does make a difference too, which oh, is so interesting. Yeah. Uh, it totally does. I remember, you know, so I started writing this last summer, I want to say early summer, and then it went into kind of fall. And all of a sudden the places I was taking the photographs at didn't look very good because <laughs> right. we, you know, we were like the, you know, it was getting darker earlier and it was like messing everything up. So, <laughs> so yeah, oh, yeah. figure, figure out the right places at the right time of day. Yeah. And you have to like do it on a day where it's going to work too. Like, you know, timing, weather, you know, oh, clouds yeah. impact, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very involved. <laughs> It is. So what are some of your favorite recipes from the book? Do you have favorites? I do. Well, I definitely have one that quickly comes to mind. Like as soon as you said favorite, I love the roasted cauliflower steak recipe. Nice. It's just, oh, it's so good. <laughs> I love it because not only are the flavor, the flavors work really well, but I love it because it uses one head of cauliflower. Oh, yeah. I always hate having, you know, half a head of cauliflower left in the fridge. Mm -hmm. and. So what I, what I do in this recipe is half of the cauliflower I steam and I make a oh. cauliflower puree. And okay. then the other half I cut into really thin steaks and I roast those. Mm. And then I lay the cauliflower steaks on top of the cauliflower puree. Oh. And I make a really yummy, flavorful kale pesto. And that's uh -huh. dotted on top of the roasted cauliflower. And then it's served with some brown lentils on the side. And it's just... It's got the creaminess from the cauliflower puree. It's got the meatiness from the lentils. It's got the roast, delicious roasted, like roasted in turmeric and garlic. And, and the flavors just work really well. And the kale pesto just kind of brings it all to life. So it's, it's definitely my favorite. Oh, that sounds delicious. I'm going to definitely yeah. have to try that. <laughs> yes, please. It's really good. I really like that one. And so and roasted in the oven, right? Is that kind of how you do it? It is. Yep. Roasted okay. at high heat in the oven. So yeah, I'd say that definitely the chickpea and sweet potato mulligatawny. Mm. I absolutely love that's a, an Indian soup and it's full of vegetables and, and lots of like flavorings like paprika and curry powder and chili powder. There's nutmeg. I add some raisins in it that are like mm. a really nice sweet touch. Um, there's red lentils in it and there's lots of vegetables. So that's, that's definitely my favorite soup in the recipe and one of my favorite, my favorites recipes in the book and one of my favorite soups too. Awesome. Well, they all look delicious. When I've looked through your book, I'm like, Ooh, that looks good. That looks good. That looks good. <laughs> and 80 is a good amount. I mean, that's a lot. That's like a lot of recipes. It is. Yep. And, and I tried to, you know, offer a, a good blend of, you know, there's sandwiches, there's breakfast items, there's baked goods, there's desserts, there's side dishes, entrees and snacks. So, you know, I hope, I hope people, you know, enjoy having the wide range of different types of dishes. Oh, absolutely. I would think so. I really like, I want to try your chickpea meatloaf too. Cause like as a vegetarian, my 
the rest of my family, they all eat meat, my husband and my kids. And so they'll have meatloaf. And then when, when they have meatloaf, I have to have something else, you know? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so I'm excited to try like some kind of meatloaf that I could have. So I'm excited to try that one out. Chickpea meatloaf. It sounds very interesting. Yes. I'm happy for you. Now you get your own meatloaf too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So this meatloaf is awesome because obviously it's plant-based, um, no animal products, but it has really great texture from the chickpeas mm. and there's pecans in it. And oh. then it's got mushrooms and tomato paste and vegan Worcestershire sauce. And that, oh, yes. those three things really add really nice umami flavor, which is that savory flavor that, that we all crave. And um, it's, it's absolutely delicious. You know, you basically cook down the mushrooms. Mushrooms have a lot of liquid. We all know that. Mm -hmm. So you want to cook it out for quite a bit and you want to get all the liquid to evaporate. And then you flavor it with the, with tomato sauce, a uh, tomato paste, sorry, and mm -hmm. yep. a little vegetable broth. And, and then you're going to add some breadcrumbs and some ground pecans, and that's going to meatify it. <laughs> mm, <laughs> and, sure. um, and then the binder that I use is aquafaba, which is that wonderful liquid that's found with chickpeas in a chickpea can. And oh. that, that works kind of like an egg white. So it's going to bind oh, sure. all the ingredients together. And then you just pack it into a, a loaf pan and bake it. And uh, you spread some ketchup on top and it's delicious. Just have it with some mashed potatoes and you're all set. That sounds perfect. So yeah, and I, I remember the day I found out that Worcestershire sauce, that there was vegan Worcestershire sauce. I was like, woohoo! Yes. You know? yes. <laughs> I didn't know that for a long time. And one day I'm like, hey, this one doesn't have it. Right? I was excited to find it. Yes, it exists. <laughs> yes, and it's good. <laughs> yep, yep. To me, it doesn't taste any different because I did try the other one because I couldn't find any other until the right. one day I found right. it. And I was like, woo! You know, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing what what you can find these days that are, are, are vegan, you know, the, between the vegan cheeses and, you know, other products. It's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah. And it might be more, more so out where you are in Minnesota, even I'm, there's more and more products all the time in the store that are vegan or alternative. And I think it's just mm -hmm. a great thing, you know, and there's just more and more of it is coming and it, maybe you've had it for a very long time on the, on the West coast already, but it's more here now than it used to be. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I do believe that. Yeah. And I do believe that California probably started a little before maybe the rest of the country, but, Blame. but yeah, it is nice to see that it is spreading and becoming more prominent. So do you have other recipes that you like to try and emulate a classic meal like meatloaf where you try to make it vegan, but it was something I'm trying to think of something that would be an example like meatloaf. Do you have any that come to mind that you've done a similar thing with and made it vegan? So as far as what's in this cookbook, the only thing that comes to mind would would probably be the jackfruit burritos because oh, sure. jackfruit, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is it's it has a very meaty texture and it also shreds really easily. So mm. it's very people liken it to pulled pork or pulled chicken or shredded chicken. So sure. so so I, I thought it would be a good use for trying to make you know a pulled pork burrito, but vegan style, obviously with with jackfruit. So. So that I've done, I would say in general, I don't know if I am really drawn to developing recipes like that. You know, I've, I saw mm -hmm. online that there was, you know, a vegan lobster roll and it's made with mm. parts of palm, I believe, instead of lobster. Okay. And, sure. and that's, that's wonderful. It's so creative. But uh, for me, that's not something that I get that excited about. <laughs> I kind of feel right. like it doesn't have to look like a lobster roll, you know, for me to eat it. Maybe I just right. want to eat parts of palm hoagie or something. You know? Right. <laughs> and just call it that. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> I get that. Kinda, that's kind of where I am right now, at least. And I like the idea too of the, the jackfruit in the burrito, because if you are eating a meal with other people who want meat, it's just, you know, you just have a bowl of jackfruit and you have a bowl of meat and everybody builds their own. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, perfect. Oh yeah, that's a fantastic idea for for feeding meat eaters and plant eaters in one house, household. Is is yeah, build your own. You know, have like fajitas one night, but everyone builds their own. So you know, if you don't want meat, you don't have to take meat. Exactly, it works out very well. So, do you like an air fryer? Do you like to use an air fryer? I have never used an air fryer. Actually. Oh, you haven't? Oh, have you? you? Haven't? 
I have. Yes. <laughs> I want to. It's one of those items where I'm like so fascinated by it, <laughs> but I've yes. never, I've never actually, you know, taken the step and bought one, but, mm. uh, you know, I work for all recipes and I have recipes on the site and, and mm. many of them air fryers that I'm always like fascinated, like, Ooh, <laughs> an air fryer recipe. <laughs> <laughs> It's time. You tell me about it. Tell me how wonderful it is. (laughs) I do like it. And we've done many things in it. We've done, of course, fries. One of the things I like about doing fries in an air fryer is you don't use very much oil. You can Mm -hmm. use a very small amount of oil. And same with anything you cook in there. We've done like fish, like my husband. Recently, we had gone a year, I guess it was in March. We went to Florida and my husband and boys went fishing. And then we froze the fish and brought it back to Minnesota. And oh, wow. so, yeah, <laughs> he likes to do that. And so then we, when we were home, he did it in the air fryer and you used to use so much less oil. And so he did mm-hmm. all the fish, which normally he would, you know, bread it and fry it in oil. He did it in the, the air fryer and it worked out really well. It was interesting. I've also done quiches in the air fryer. I've done eggs, uh, squash. That's awesome. Just, there's so many things you can do in it. It's just interesting because also because you're not heating up a big, huge oven, you're heating up the small units, you know, and it, right. it heats up so quickly. It's like, boom, it's, you know, ready <laughs> <laughs> because it's so small. It's a small area to heat, right? So it's just like, boom, it's ready. So that's the nice that's part about awesome. it. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Yet, yet, another, yet another reason why I need to buy an air fryer. <laughs> <laughs> and they might be making them smaller. My, mine's kind of, I feel like mine's a little bit bulky. It's kind of like an egg, but I feel okay. like they're getting smaller and smaller, but everything always seems to do that when technology gets better, like things get smaller yeah. and smaller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Their smartphones, you know, like yeah. smaller. So yeah, so I definitely do enjoy it. It's, it's a good one. And the hard part for me is, feeding all five of us, it's a small space, you know, to cook it in. So I may have to do multiple batches of something just to get enough to feed all five of us. But if I'm doing something that's a side dish, then it works better because you don't need as much, you know? Right, right, right. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So tell me more about your other cookbooks. Do you, did you enjoy doing them? What, what was, what was fun or anything that stuck out in your mind about what you like or a recipe you like, or what was fun about it or any kind of story? Oh gosh, I I love all my other cookbooks. You know, they were all written, you know, different times in my life, and and I I love going back to them. You know, especially the older ones, and you know, making different recipes from them, and being like, I'm always like surprised, like, oh, that's really good. You know, like, <laughs> I love that. You, know, you don't make it for a long time, and you forget. And I was like, oh, I like yes. this. So, yeah, and I'm, you know, I obviously am a fan of other people's cookbooks too. So I, you know, I have a whole stash, and I, I just. I've always loved cookbooks. You know, I I was raised by parents who loved to cook. So Mm. I spent, I mean, my fondest memories are having them cook in the kitchen. And I, you know, when I was little, I would just sit on the floor in the kitchen and open the bottom cabinet where my mom kept all her recipe cards, because that's what Mm. they did back then was the recipe cards. (laughs) (laughs) And I would just flip through them and read them and just, I was fascinated with them. And I I loved all her old, you know, Betty Crocker cookbooks, like all of them. Oh, yes. Just flipping through all of them and looking at the photos and just fascinated with the different types of, you know, cooking methods and ingredients. So I just, I feel so fortunate that I'm able to write cookbooks and it's wonderful to spend, you know, six months to a year writing these recipes and then to have it, you know, be put into a cookbook and, and delivered to your house and then to be able to open it and see it put together. It's, it's such a fun, awesome feeling. And that's why I continue to do it. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's all those memories, all of that just not even just remembering making them, the remembering the flavors and maybe mm-hmm. you made it for certain people. Yeah. It's just a full of memories as well. It's not just recipes for you. And, and that's, that's awesome. And yeah. then people who use the book can also, they're going to get memories too, you know? Sure. Yeah. And that's what, you know, and I also, I do mention that in, in plant-based, easy plant-based cooking for two is that, you know, I am terrible at following a recipe's directions. Like I love to you know, just improvise. And yeah, I don't, if I don't have one ingredient, I'm going to substitute it for another. And I'm all about that. And then I encourage people to do that with my recipes because everyone's got different tastes. 
you know, and, and so maybe you don't like kale, but you like Swiss chard. So go ahead and use Swiss chard. It's okay. You know, just right. use my recipes as inspirations to create your own. Yeah. And I like how you said in the book too, at one point, I think you said something about like, you know, if you want meat, you can take these recipes and just add meat. You know, mm-hmm. it's just, it's, you know what I mean? It's not hard. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, you don't even have to think of it as, oh, that's only vegan. Oh no, that's over there. You, right. you just, you can make it your own and just plop some chicken on there, you know? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yes. So where else are you that people can find you? You have a, on Instagram, right? What's your Instagram? Yeah. So my Instagram handle is my name at Shack, and my website is LaysheShack.com. So I'm very easy to find. <laughs> and, that's awesome. And um, if you just search my name on Amazon, all my books will pop up. So yeah. I, if, if, if you're looking for a wonderful plant-based introductory cookbook, please check out my book. That's awesome. Was well, there anything else you'd like to talk about that we haven't touched on or, or share? Gosh, just thank you for having me. <laughs> this has been so wonderful talking to you. And it's, it's such a wonderful opportunity to promote not only my book, but just plant-based eating in general. I have found that the people I have spoken to about my book and some of the blurb reviewers of my book, like they're just so excited that I've written a plant-based cookbook and they just want everyone to start eating more plants. And I, I honestly have never experienced this before with my other cookbooks where people have been so like excited for this book and excited for me. And they think it's so great that it's cooking for two. And so there's limited waste. And, and I just think there's a lot of positives about, about this book. that I think a lot of people would benefit from. Yeah. And I think too, for me, just even, you know, our family of five, but I think about the fact that with your cookbook, if if my rest of my family is eating something else, I could make something for myself from your cookbook and I wouldn't have all this extra. You know what I mean? Because yeah, you <laughs> have, the, I mean, leftovers are great, but you don't want a ton of leftovers. Right. And so for me, this is going to work too for just like filling in when I'm going to have something different that everybody else has in my family. So there's so many different ways I feel like people could use your cookbook. You know, that's one way I definitely would see for myself that I would use it too. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And and that makes me so happy to hear that. <laughs> well, it is a great idea. And I, I think it's a great thing for people to consider just even the health benefits like you talked about in the beginning of our talk. You know, it's just a healthier way to live to have more of them. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, I want to thank you so much for coming on my show. This is great. I'm really excited to put this out to the world and share you and your books with my audience. I'm excited to share. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate it. You have an amazing day. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast episode, and I'm excited to share this with you. I also want to announce that my cookbook is now live. My cookbook is American Midwest Cooking Quiches, and it is now live as of today, actually. (laughs) I'm really excited that it's live. And so I will put that link down in the podcast notes. I'm still looking for reviewers. If anybody would like to review my cookbook, it would be very helpful to me. And it helped me launch this book. And I will put all of Lay's links down there as well. So you can easily find her cookbooks, all of her amazing, beautiful cookbooks. The one that I have is a hardcover. It's Easy Plant-Based Cooking for Two. The Delicious Vegan Recipes to Enjoy Together. It's a beautiful book. Get it. And so check down in the podcast notes where her links are and you can find her. Follow her on Instagram. And I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope you enjoy all the great ideas, all the yummy food, and enjoy your day. Have a great one. Bye-bye now.